Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Welcome to Killer Women, a proud member of the Authors on the Air global network with more than 4 million listeners. I'm your host, suspense author, Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Kimberly Bell. Hi. Kimberly is the USA Today and internationally best-selling author with over 1 million copies sold worldwide with titles including The Paris w- Widow, The Marriage Lie, a Goodreads Choice Award semifinalist for Best Mystery and Thriller, and the co-authored number one Audible original, Young Rich Widows. Kimberly's novels have been optioned for film and television and selected by Library Reads and Amazon and Apple book ed- Books editors as Best Books of the Month and the International Thriller Writers as nominee for the Best Book of the Year. Kimberly divides her time between Atlanta and Amsterdam. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Kimberly and I had a little rosé before this started, <laughs> so it's possible that I'm a little more relaxed. I'm also still fighting a, a cold that I've had for like 10 days because I have spent the month in New York, and it turns out... It'll take your voice. So we are here today to talk about the fabulous Paris Widow, which if you were paying attention uh, a couple days, a few days ago, I posted a quote from that with Kimberly here in my little Chelsea apartment. We also have George. Uh, George is with us today because he's in love with Kimberly and he literally (laughs) will not leave her alone. So I'm trying to hold him down. Um, So Kim, before we get started talking about all the fabulous stuff, can you tell our listeners a little bit about The Paris Widow? Absolutely. So The Paris Widow is about Estella and Adam. They are married, very happily married. They are on the tail end of a whirlwind vacation, kind of the trip of a lifetime, three weeks in all of Stella's favorite places in Europe. They've experienced it together. And on the very last day of their vacation, tragedy strikes. Adam is in a restaurant when it explodes and he disappears. And then after that, soon after that, the police come to Stella and they say that Adam wasn't just one of the victims, but also the target of the bombing. And Adam is a rare dealer. He, he, he searches out antiquities for, for buildings in his hometown. Right, right. You know, probably like ornate trams and things that come and then he can purchase. Flooring, things like that, bathtub sinks, all the things that go into a house. He takes them from these beautiful antique historical homes and resells them in Atlanta. He has a store. So tell us about that because um, obviously you're uh, in Atlanta. Uh, uh, you live in Atlanta at least part of the time. We're talking about her amazing life of splitting time. But um, there's also a lot about art in here, a lot about um, pieces that came from like Oscar Wilde as mentioned and other, you know, and much, much older pieces. So how did you do the research to sort of talk about those pieces and are they real? I was curious about that too. Yes, a lot of the pieces in this particular story are real artifacts that have been lost and then found again. And I'm, I'm gonna come back to that, but Good. I wanna talk about like, um, when I first came up with this idea, I had pitched the story and I had him doing something in finance. I don't even remember what. And my editor at the time said, I'd like for him to have something a little more tangible, like really concrete, you know, that gives a little more of an idea. Because finance is something yeah. so complicated. Anybody like, can do that. I don't understand math. <laughs> exactly. That's why it's I just finance. Books, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Math. Exactly. But um, so she was right. And I don't even remember how I landed on the antique piece. But as soon as I started looking into that, um, I came upon these articles about blood antiquities. And I was like, what's that? Right? But right. it's basically these pieces of history from these important historical sites that are being pillaged, often in war-torn countries, being pulled out of temples, churches, historical sites, smuggled over international borders, and sold to the highest bidder. And often, the highest bidder is someone that on the outside at at least looks very legit. Like, if you Google it, blood antiquities museums, you'll find a ton museums that have been like called out and have to return whatever it is that they bought because they find out later that you know it was illegally obtained or 
um, had illegal paperwork or whatever it is. So, you know, they're landing in galleries, museums, private collectors' homes, and they're there's just a lot of shenanigans that yeah. happens between the actual temple and where they end up. Yeah, and all that, I mean, the documentation of it, like, you know, I'm sure the forgery is rampant and... People getting paid at the borders to look the other way. Yeah, kind of, You know, there's nothing in that box over there. Yeah. It's, well, it's, I, I particularly, I think because we're writers, I was particularly interested in the Oscar Wilde. Yes. So talk about that piece, because that was really interesting. I'm trying to like picture it, some buckles. Yeah, so in my research, I came across this man. He's Dutch. His name is Arthur Brand, yeah. B-R-A-N-D-T. Google him, he's fascinating. But he calls himself, and I kind of stole that, his, his moniker for this book. He calls himself the, or actually, I think it was a newspaper that called him that, the Indiana Jones of the yeah. art world. Yeah. Because his mission is to find these historical pieces and return them to their official owners, right. respectful owners. So the Oscar Wilde ring, which I use as a plot device in this particular story, was a real thing. Yeah. And he found it. And, you know, it was this, this uh, ring that you read it. It's been a minute since I read it. It's like it, buckles. It, so, it sounds like it was made of... But I think it was Oscar Wilde gave it to someone or someone gave it to Oscar Wilde. I can't remember which yeah. one, but it had these, it had um, initials on the inside yes. that stood for... Yes. Oh, wow, wow. Right. It was yeah. like, it was. It was a it, lot of initials. It was a lot. And it was like <laughs> from so-and-so to so-and-so. Because Oscar Wilde's real name is really long. It's exactly. all these initials. Yes, yeah. exactly. I think it was from someone to Oscar. Yeah. But I might be getting it wrong too. But, and um, it was just a gold band with you know it looked like a belt buckle yeah and, and, um, and she's she wear you know when she's looking when Stella is looking for Adam she's wearing it on her thumb you know because she finds it amongst his things and is, she's like and of course it's noticeable it's very distinctive and um, and it was a piece that was lost for like I don't know 40 50 years yeah and people thought it was destroyed yeah you know, like melted down for the gold and then he this Oscar guy or, uh, sorry, uh, Arthur got Yeah, Oscar, he, Oscar, Oscar right. Arthur. See, it's the rosé. I'm just going to say right now, it's the rosé. <laughs> he actually found this ring, and he returned it to the Oscar Wilde Foundation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, so, you know, it's, it's so far beyond, like, obviously what I know about art, which is almost zero. But it's really fun when there's these real yeah. pieces, and, of course, anything that is, you know, writer-related. But, but so much of, so many of the things you talk about are, are really, you know, they are, as you said, like, and we've heard of blood diamonds, so it's exact. It's the same thing, but it's these, you know, precious things. And there are people. It sounds like who, I mean, some. There's an argument to be said that they will keep them safe, right? Which is an argument made in the book by one such person. But there's also the argument that that keeps them away from, right. you know, right? A people. private collector keeping them safe, but then yeah. that means that nobody can see it. Yeah. Yeah. So this, so the whole, the one thing I love, I love about this book, and you do a beautiful job, is the, is the, is that balancing in the question the whole time: is Adam a good guy or is he a bad guy? Because Stella's love for him, uh, and she has her own backstory, which you get right. to learn about, which is also super fascinating. And you, and you know, you do a beautiful job of this like little tiny little hint in the very very beginning of the book and we're like what is that related to and we don't really find out until much later in the book which I love but you know but we want we're really rooting for Adam not to be um not to be a bad guy I want to talk about marriage Kimberly because obviously we all know <laughs> that I am coming to the subject now with a slightly <laughs> different perspective than I had two years ago um and your books really do like so many of them um the marriage lie the uh what was the last one about the personal assistant? Yeah, the personal assistant. My darling husband. My darling, yes. <laughs> yeah, you are a like theme for sure. It is. And yet you have this. We also talked about her family, and you have this incredible relationship with your husband, which is so amazing. I think you're one of like four <laughs> people that I know that have really very enviable marriages. And I'm so glad. So we'll keep it that way. Dutchman, behave yourself. Um, <laughs> but tell us about that. Like, what's you know, why? What are you? Why are you drawn to that? Do you think? You know, I don't really know where that came from. It kind of just evolved. But I think for me, it's um, you know the universal fear of being sharing a home, a bed, a life with someone, and being betrayed by them in a way that, like, can you forgive them? 
can you move on if you know why they did it so that's part of you know this story is we find out what's going on what Adam has done and why he has done these things is it forgivable is it not I don't know and I think you know in the beginning of the story Stella might have had a different answer than at the end of the story it's a really good point that's yeah. absolutely right and I mean it's nuanced right like her like you find out your, if you found out your husband, well, I, I can speak from a personal experience, <laughs> but no, but if you found out your husband suddenly was, you know, Im implicated in real, in some really serious sort of, you know, art crimes and, you know, what, what is your first thought? You know, cause I think it's interesting that like Stella immediately, there's moments where she sort of has doubt, right? Because of course, who wouldn't have doubt? Like, could this possibly be true? Could this possibly be the person I know? And yet she also has sort of a resounding faith um, in him. And I, I think that's admirable. Like, how do you keep that faith, right? Yeah. How do you sort of, you know, how do you know? And she refuses to leave. Everybody is telling her, yeah. get out of Paris, go home. You're not safe. You're not safe here. And she's seen some real evidence that that is true. Um, and she's had people approach her who don't, who aren't who they seem to be. Right. And yet she sort of refuses to leave you know, because she's like, I'm going to, this is my, she has to know the truth. She yeah. has to know the truth. Right. And I think, I think, you know, for Stella to part of, um, what helps her understand maybe and, and have that faith is she's done some stuff in her, she's got some stuff in her past that she's not proud of either. Right. And so she wants to know the real truth about Adam, not just, you know, did he do these things, but why? Right. And it kind of does make a difference, right? I mean, it is true. Like she has, yeah. And I love her backstory is really amazing too, but th maybe that's a really good point. Like how many of us can like see something that somebody did and be like, well, they are, I would, you know, I've never done anything bad. I've never done anything I'm ashamed of. I've never been, right. you know, and we all sort of have to stop and be like, oh, there was that other thing I did. There was that time. There was that time. <laughs> is it worse? Yeah. It is mine forgivable? And oftentimes, like, those aren't things, especially if they happen before the relationship, they're not things we share right. with new partners. Right, right. So we're, you know, so there's things that Adam doesn't know about Stella, same as Stella doesn't know about Adam. Right. Um... And that's, uh, it's so, it is interesting, but you really do have a, you really do have sort of a fascination about, maybe it is about sort of understanding motive. Cause I think about yeah. other books where it is, you know, and the personal assistant is a really good one. Like, well, you know, and if you haven't read that, you need to go back now. There's lots of reasons in the marriage lie is another one. You know, why do these people make these decisions right. under what sort of pressure would each of right. us do something really terrible? Right. And there is a reason, right? Yeah. There's always a reason. Um, and I think that to me is is more um, what I'm drawn to in these stories more than the marriage. I think marriage is just because, like I said, it's a universal. Everybody, even if you're not married, if you've never been married, you can kind of put yourself in that position. Totally. What it would be like to be betrayed by that person or to be lied to by that person. But for me, the real um, thing that's the most fascinating is like where's the line in the sand where I will go up to here and forgive you and once you cross that line then no more but when you find out the reasons and the motivations right. and the and the circumstances that that were in place for that person to make that decision then sometimes that line can move oh no question like if you you know if somebody threatened one of my children right like right there's no line exactly I would come after you yeah you know exactly so and, and that's I just think that's fascinating and there are is. a million stories I could tell with that well you're it sounds like you're lined <laughs> up to tell about a million but I think that is a really good point and I think you know it's actually and you made a point when you talked about marriage because everybody can understand it but it's it is sort of the you know we can talk about like um family right like your parents your siblings your children but that's different right because it's a there's a blood bond there mm -hmm. and there's some sense that like when my brother walks around he walks around with part of me and my children for sure but my spouse is this to like raised right. to and often, usually you don't know you know what they tell you about how they grew up and you know about you meet their parents and understand that, but you, you don't actually grow up with them. Mm -hmm. You don't usually know kind of all the things they went through. So you take their interpretation, their perspective of their upbringing as the truth. Right. When in fact, you know, 
even if they're trying to present it honestly, a lot of times it's their truth, but not necessarily the truth. Exactly. And is there a truth, right? right. Like yeah. everybody's truth is going to be a little different yeah. based on wherever they come from. So I love, and I love that. Now I thought it was interesting too. And some of it is, I obviously makes sense for the story, but the question of children with Adam and Syl, and are they never, they don't have children. They don't have children. And I think they're, you know, they, I don't remember exactly how long they've been married when the story takes place, but not super long. Yeah, right. right. So right. they just haven't gotten to the place where they're talking about kids yet. It's kind of a, one day right and the time i mean he does mention like a house in the south of france with like six children and she's you know she's like really yeah we're gonna have kids yeah exactly so but you're right it's been like five it's only been like five five years since they've been married but um but it is an interesting thing because that of course you know and you think you know even in her mind when this is unraveling that has to be another factor like Mm -hmm. could you trust him again and then you know Having children with somebody who you've been through something like this is a whole different step, right? Right. I mean, yes, now I trust him. He did something for the right reason, if that's the side you come up with. But then, you know, children, too. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. it's a forever kind of thing, it's for sure. It's a forever kind <laughs> yeah. of thing. And before we got on air, Kimberly and I were talking about the people we know who have been in situations where their husbands, one of them was me, of course, did things that, that came so out of the blue Mm -hmm. and so unexpected and so um painful and yet we also talked about the fact that you know it is it's a context thing right it's about where they were in their lives and not about how you go forward with them because clearly i don't think in this case i you don't but people do really crazy things yeah and you know everybody makes mistakes even if they're doing it for the right reason People can make mistakes, and I think it's, you know, I don't know. I think this is something that I I, I work on in my books, and I maybe work through for myself yeah. as well. It's like, you know, okay, they've made a mistake, but how do they how do they move forward? Are they changed by it? Have they learned by it, or do they just keep on going, making the same mistakes over and over? I just think, you know, it's it's human to do things that or maybe ill-advised sometimes. Right, and I think, you know, and to the point, like the people like, for instance, who are hoarding these antiquities, they can, they can, you know, justify it however they want. It's really greed, right? And I think when we get down to things like greed, which can be a motivator and is probably oftentimes a motivator for everybody, right? We all need money to survive. And, but there's, if there's that sort of, means, there's like some of them you can be like, that's a no brainer. That's a no, right? We're yeah. done with you. Right. But then when there's other things in there, when there's protection of family or, you know, or people that are close to you, then we it start, it's really gray. Mm-hmm. It's not nearly as black and white. I feel yeah. like when I started this job, I was like, there's bad and there's good. No. Yeah, no, and I, you know, I think those are the most interesting villains, too. The ones that do things that you're like, oh, I see why they did that. Mm -hmm. Probably would have made a different choice myself, but I can see why that, you know. Absolutely. And so I think those are the the fun stories to write where there is a lot of gray area. So now how did this, so this idea you said, you were talking about sort of how it came to you and you had written a sort of the, um, Adam was in finance and your writer was like, no, we want him to, how did, did it happen in Paris? Or were you just like, and I know this girlfriend, were you just like, <laughs> I need an excuse to go to Paris for like a month and, you know, write it off? Because yeah. I think you might be the smartest person right now. <laughs> no, but what was it? I mean, it's beautifully set and obviously you, you, you can picture Paris in the story, yeah. which is so fun. Yeah. The language is there as well as in other languages. But tell us about, you know, why Paris? So I actually pitched this story as set in Amsterdam uh-huh. because I know Amsterdam, love that city, lived there half the year. Yeah. And I just, I have been wanting to write a story in Europe for many, many years. Yeah. And every book I pitch and they're like, nope. Atlanta. And, <laughs> Let's go yeah. back to Atlanta. They're we like, like Atlanta. We like you in the South. Yeah. Like, oh, Really? So, but I finally came with a premise that they were excited about. Yeah. And it makes sense that this premise is not in... Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And then they said, well, but you know, Amsterdam is so niche. Can you set it in Paris? 
instead because Paris is so hot right now and I was like well that's a You're whole like, different country twist my, but okay. right right <laughs> does that mean I have to go to Paris okay I think I can do this in <laughs> yeah so they were the ones who actually said Paris but it was always going to be in Europe and I said I would be Paris 100% on board but I have these flashback scenes I want to take us outside of Paris I want to take us to other countries as well so so I you had to, to do like a big tour you're <laughs> I like to listen to all I, these places yeah that is so fun yeah. how I mean it's interesting because obviously with everything that's available to us online we can absolutely do we can write places without going there but what like tell us about the magic of being in a place when you're writing about it because it is real it is real and I think you know in this story what I really um kind of leaned into was that American being in a foreign place where you have no idea what the people are even saying, what's going on, how things work in this country. And so I really leaned into that, especially in the Paris scenes, you know, when the police come in and the police forces in Paris are very confusing because they have, you know, the national, they have the Paris police force, they have a bunch of different things all working together. And she's Stella is completely confused by it, as was I when I was doing the research. Yeah. Um, but there is something, you know, about being in a place and experience it for yourself and translating that to the page. I don't think I could have done it without actually seeing these places. And we did, like, especially like at that lunch, um, you know, with the galettes and the, the yeah. cobblestone street. You think about that, like, is it something that... It's, it's so ubiquitous in in Europe, but you know those all those little bistro tables set outside of you know under an awning and the you know s endless cigarette smoke along with the food. It's it is really, and I think in, when it's done, when an author has the opportunity to really sort of capture it, you can read it on the page. Like yeah. I, you know, yeah. I felt like I was there as well. Oh, so thank you. It's it's fun. It's armchair travel for sure. Yeah. Especially when you get to read a book like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's a, it's the best thing about being in a novel is the opportunity to be somewhere, you know, be somewhere yeah. home and somewhere else. Right. So you have, this is not the only thing that Kimberly Bell is up to in her life. <laughs> she is a very, very busy woman. So I, I can't imagine there are people out there who A, don't know Kimberly Bell and B, don't know about the Young Rich Widows um, because we had them on the show. And, um, and Kimberly, actually, you were my second ever show. What really? would that have been? It wasn't the personal assistant. It was, was before it the, that. Um, my darling husband. Was it? I don't, I don't know. Was that the one before? Yeah. Then it was. The, it must have been the darling husband because it was 2022. Yeah. 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 So that has been all that time. That was my first pandemic book. Yeah. It was well. That was a fact. I mean, all of your books have been fabulous. I am such a fan. But um, tell us about. So we also had the dirty the. My own, sorry, <laughs> dirty. Rich I was gonna say <laughs> dirty rich widows. That's my own brain uh, firing. See, I'm telling you, it's the rosé. It's the, rose. the middle of the day. <laughs> it's the rose. I might have to have a nap before dinner. But um, yeah, so tell us about Young Rich Widows, which has been was such a phenomenal. Um, just give us a little blurb about that. It's an audible original. Well, it started as an audible original. It started as audible original, but it's now in print um, with source books. But it is a story about four women who inherit this law firm when they're partners who or husbands blow up in a plane and it's a real thing apparently if you are a partner in a law firm in Rhode Island I think it's a oh, right it's in Rhode Island it's, yeah. yeah this is a Many, Vanessa Lilly yeah. her husband is an attorney yeah. in Rhode Island so yeah. I think this is where this came from yeah and you inherit the law firm so these four women who have no law degrees inherit not just the firm but all the problems of the firm it's set in the 80s um, in Providence, Rhode Island, which apparently in the 80s was super mobbed up, so the mob is after them. They owe them $4 million, which apparently blew up in the plane because they don't know where the money is. And so these four women who, you know, have very little in common and have very um, different lives and a lot of reasons to not really like each other have to band together and figure out what's going on, how to pay off the mob, and how to survive. Yeah, so fun. Yeah, and there's more than one, you know, attempts on their lives, and there's, like, grown-up children of one who are involved, and it's super, super fun to read, and, or listen, and now you can read it. And then you have another one that is just out. I do, Desperate Deadly Widows, and that's out on Audible now, and it will be coming out next spring.
spring as a book as well. We just and perhaps we may even be looking forward to future ones. We, we won't have lots of thoughts on books three and four. And so. where were you guys that I saw you on a billboard? Oh my gosh, yes. Where was the billboard? So right outside of Audible in New Jersey, their offices in New Jersey, and they have like this giant billboard. We got off the train and I was like, oh my gosh. And it was your, you got the train, it was you guys? It was Desperate Deadly Widows, the, the cover. Um, of Desperate Deadly Widows, it was crazy. I love that you went to their offices. Yeah. You've done so many fun things. And you were just today in Bryant Park for a reading. Yeah, of have, that was Young Rich Widows. Young Rich yeah. Widows. Yeah. And were all the gals there? Yes. Oh my God, we so were there. Cool. Plus, they get to, you can't see that Kimberly's wearing the most fabulous fuchsia <laughs> Satin I'm in cargo kind pants. Of sort of oh my gear. god, it's so <laughs> fabulous. I'm I, I've seen these before, and I'm like, okay, I she's too tall. I couldn't fit into them, but otherwise, otherwise I would try to borrow steel. Okay, well, tell us about what is coming next. Obviously, you are already hard at work. As as it works, you know, you guys, a book is coming out, but that does not mean there's any break to be had. No, so, no breaks to be had. What are you so. working on? Well, hopefully very soon we will be starting on book three of the Young Rich Widows. Uh, it'll be a four book series. Yay! Maybe more, but we're, we definitely have books three and four because each widow gets a story. Okay, I love it. So, That's um, Desperate idea. Deadly Widows is Camille, my character story. The okay. first one belongs to Justine, and then we got two more characters. So, two more books. So fun. <laughs> And then I am currently in edits for my 2025 book. I don't have a title. I don't have any sort of information about when it will be out, but, but I'm in edits for that. So Another domestic suspense. An internationally domestic oh. suspense. I love it. If this one is with expats. They live in Amsterdam. Oh, she Amsterdam. got it. She got it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That's so fun. So that'll be next 2025's book. Yes. And then, you know, how does it work? Are you somebody who has like a dozen ideas and you're like, what should I focus on now? Are you more like, what's going to happen next? I need a new idea. Yeah, that kind of. I mean, I, I'm kind of a one idea at a time. Me too. Gal. Totally. And so I have kind of a little bit in my head what I think my next story should be like, but I haven't worked any of the details out. And then I have to pitch it, of course, to my editor. Um, this, this book... 2025 book the Amsterdam book is my last one in my contract so we'll be renegotiating yes. and all that stuff yes. so that exciting and also terrifying <laughs> and yeah also a pain yeah I, I don't know. like it I know of course nobody likes it we're really we, if we could be salaried we would totally yeah. try to figure that out it's so it's so fun well you guys if you haven't and this is book number what is this six this is officially my number nine so, nine oh, yeah so far I am behind <laughs> um yeah this is number nine. I'm reading them all, and I'm. I think there's only one I've missed. So this is the newest, the Paris Widow, Kimberly Bell. She's on an incredible backlist. If you haven't read her books, you have to start right this second, and also catch her with the other um, Deadly Widows, which is so fun. The the rich, deadly, desperate, widows. desperate and young. <laughs> Rich, desperate, young, deadly <laughs> widows. I love it. So fun to have you. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. And I got wine. Yes, rosé. <laughs> Clearly, you guys will know when I'm not drinking rosé next time. And I managed to keep George, George off of Kimberly's lap for most of the show. So, everybody, this is Killer Women with Kimberly Bell. I'm your host, Danielle Gerard, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.